Hi, y'all. My name is Mr. Chow, and welcome to Chow Time. I'm back with another episode on a Grand Seiko. This time I'm reviewing a spring drive. This is the SBGE257. It's the one with the green dial and bezel. I'll have to admit, when I first saw the watch and I first put it on, I knew immediately this could be a contender for the number one uh, watch in my, in my uh, scoring so far. So big old shout out to uh, my friend who let me borrow this. Again, this channel wouldn't be possible without the support of people like him, and so I greatly appreciate that. Um, also, if you want to check out the description below, there is a link to my Instagram. I put watches that um, I put for sale on there, and uh, the proceeds I get from that is how I buy watches to make my reviews. And hopefully in the next uh, few weeks here, I'll have some some new reviews uploaded. So how I review watches is by scoring them against a rubric that I've created and that has a mix of somewhat uh, objective categories such as the case, movement, and, uh, and dial and the uh, su a slightly more subjective category in um, brand heritage and prestige. I then apply a value multiplier to get a value score and then I rank all the watches that I've reviewed so far in both the total score and the value score. After the review, I give a completely subjective uh, opinion on the watch based on my own purchasing style and how I make my watch purchasing decisions. Before we get into the review though, uh, I want to talk about the purpose of the watch and perhaps the design language that inspires it. Well, it's kind of a classy um, dress watch that has the functionality of a sports watch. The Grand Seiko um, ethos is kind of built around this um, dress watch aesthetic, but, um, but it's also very functional. So let's get into the review. We'll start with the function, feel, and visual appeal of the case and bracelet. Since this is my second experience with Grand Seiko, my expectations are a bit tempered now. The stainless steel case shape is quite reminiscent of the Snowflake, which is probably the most well-known Grand Seiko watch in the lineup. It has a 4 o'clock crown though, which shifts the movement inside, placing the power reserve slightly off from the Snowflake's location. Back to the case though. The Zeratsu finish is amazing. The knife's edge that divides types of finish is the best I reviewed on a watch so far. The polish is well done and the brushing is fine and straight. The curves of the case and the shape of the lugs help the watch hug the wrist, which aids in the comfort tremendously. The bracelet fits the case well in terms of tolerance and style. The midlinks have a small amount of articulation but don't swing freely, which is not the best for comfort, but at least it's not just for show. Links can be added or removed with the tiniest of screwdrivers, still better than pins and collars. And this double push button deployment clasp looks great and has a wide range of micro adjust holes, which I appreciate as someone whose wrists swell day to day. The only thing I don't like about this type of clasp is when it's shut, there is a gap between the bracelet and the clasp, as you can see here. The crown is ever so slightly undersized, but it is knurled to help with the grip. It has a deeply negative engraved logo, which looks great. When shut, it provides the watch with 200 meters of water resistance, which is often one of my must-have features of a watch. The shiny green ceramic bezel provides the GMT hand with some engraved and painted numerals to point at. It is sloped and fits the design language of the case well. There is a bit of an overhang, so some dust and grime does accumulate there. And finally, there is an ever so slightly double domed sapphire crystal with an anti-reflective coating, helping with viewing the insides and minimizing distortion, 
while having a beautiful crystal. What more could anyone ask for? 9 out of 10 for form, 8 out of 10 for function. Let's move on to the dial. It has a very subtle sunburst finish that is honestly hard to see unless in bright lights or from certain angles. Otherwise, the dial looks matte. I'm not sure how they pull that off. Let's start with these indices as I think they are incredible. Each stands tall and they have a variety of shapes and finishes. The most amazing thing is how they reflect light. There are slivers of polish that catches the light and the whole dial shimmers when in almost any lighting condition. What really captures my attention is how the brushed portions refract the light like a prism, splitting the light into a rainbow of colors. The four cardinal directions each have a rhomboid slice of loom helping with legibility at night. To be honest though, the hands and indices do such a good job of reflecting light that just a small amount of light is enough to read the watch. However, when looking at the dial in complete darkness, telling the time can be a bit of a chore instead of being quick and efficient. The hands are finished in just as high quality with similar types of finish and shapes. Although the brushing on the hour and minute hand don't have the same rainbow reflections as the hour markers. The GMT hand is painted a bronzish gold, which complements the green dial and bezel well. Both colors seem inspired by colors seen in bamboo forests. The Grand Seiko logo is applied and given a matte silver finish. There are some painted elements on the dial. All are very clean and crisp. The printed rehalt does add some functionality, but seems a bit redundant with the GMT bezel already present. Simple dots would have sufficed, adding the slightest bit of clutter to an otherwise well-composed dial. There is a power reserve indicator that uses painted elements and a polished hand. Every single element of the dial is well executed and adds to the overall aesthetic. Nine and a half out of 10 for form, eight and a half out of 10 for function. Let's move on to that spring drive movement. The movement in this watch is the 9R66. It's a spring drive movement, which basically means that it's a mechanically driven watch with a quartz regulated clutch, giving the second hand a smooth sweep, imitating the passage of time. It is accurate to plus or minus one second per day and has an impressive power reserve of 72 hours. There are two complications, the GMT hand and a date. There is a wave-like finish on the rotor and bridge. However, without opening the case, I cannot properly assess the movement's quality of finish. What I can say is that spring drive movements I've seen through exhibition case backs are beautiful. 8.5 out of 10 for form, 7.5 out of 10 for function, giving us a total score so far of 53.5. Let's move on to the last category, the brands, heritage, and prestige. Grand Seiko was originally a branch of Seiko created to compete with the major Swiss watchmakers. At first, Grand Seiko, along with King Seiko, tried to compete with the Swiss on their own terms. But after they swept the Swiss chronometer competition, the Swiss changed their rules and did not allow any watchmaker outside of Switzerland to compete. In the ensuing years, Grand Seiko continued to push the boundaries of watchmaking, iterating, improving their quartz and automatic movements. In the early 2000s, Grand Seiko started using the spring drive, a combination of quartz and mechanical movement technologies borrowed from their parent company, Seiko. I believe this is one of the most notable achievements to watchmaking history. More recently though, Grand Seiko has become famous and indeed synonymous for extremely high quality dials and case construction finishing. In fact, among enthusiasts, the company has become a bit of a rising underdog, becoming almost legendary for producing watches that compete well above its price point. All the while, the company seems to be marching to the beat of its own drum. 
Their watch styles are unique and the technologies they implement at this price point are unmatched. For being so highly rated among enthusiasts and for having a relatively large group of hardcore fans, Grand Seiko scores a 8 out of 10 for brand heritage and prestige, giving it a total of 61.5 out of 70 points. The SBGE257 is one of three variations on the same style of watch that is currently in production. They can be found from $4,000 to $5,500 and can be found on the used market between four dollars and $5,000. I'll use $5,000 to calculate the value multiplier because you can find near new examples at that price pretty regularly. This means that the value multiplier is bottomed out at 1 and the value score therefore remains at 61.5. Grand Seiko has done it! The Omega has finally been displaced in total score and comes in at a respectable 11th in value. So. That brings me to my personal opinion on this watch. And I guess I'll just start with the case. It fits, I think, perfectly on my wrist. For reference, I have a 16 and a half centimeter wrist, and this is a 40.5 millimeter case. And there is a lot of talk currently about watches being too big if it overhangs your wrist. Um, I don't think that's true. I don't think that there is really, I mean, what is too big and too small is, is such a personal thing that um, all this discussion about like, is this too big for my wrist or is this too small? I think that's, that's basically all just nonsense. Um, I've had watches that overhang my wrist and look fine. I've had other watches that overhang my wrist and do not look fine <laughs> and um, it, it really is just up to the person wearing it if they want to try to pull it off. Moving on, the finishing is fine and sharp. It really is quite extraordinary. The case shape seems to be made as the perfect combination of form and function. The rounded edges on the case actually make it feel much smaller than it is and when you bend your wrist back you can't really even feel it. It's details like this that make me enjoy a watch on another level. The water resistance is usually a big factor for me when selecting a watch, so I'm glad this has 200 meters of water resistance. The bracelet is pretty good, but not perfect. I don't like the gap between the clasp and the bracelet. However, I do like how thin the clasp is and the overall comfort of the watch and bracelet combination. The dial is subtle, but still interesting. I'll start with what I don't like here. First, the numerals on the Rehalt seem completely unnecessary, and unnecessary is not the perfect combination of form and function. Also, I feel like any watch should have bloom on all of the indices, not just the four cardinal directions. It just, if you want to be able to see the, the time at night, you want it to be just as quick and easy as during the day. It is slightly offset by the fact that the polished parts reflect almost any amount of light. And I guess that brings me to the movement, the spring drive inside. The smoothness is the perfect embodiment of time, in my opinion, because the passage of time never stops. And so a quartz hand that stops every second or stops for a second um, or even any kind of mechanical movement that has an escapement that stops the, you know, that has vibrations per second. Um, that's not truly the, what is elegant about time and about how imperceptible it is sometimes. There are times that you look at the spring drive watch and it's hard to tell that the watch is even um, working because there's nothing about the second hand that draws attention to it. Because for me, every moment is a passing moment. There is no snapshot in our human experience. And I feel a calmness when contemplating time as I observe the second hand slowly gliding across the dial. It just feels effortless, like a force of nature. And to me, that is the perfect marriage of form and function. 
So, do you agree with my scoring? Is there anything that you would like to change about the rubric? Let me know in the comments below, along with any suggestions on watches I should review next. Thanks for making it to the end. I appreciate you so much. Bye, y'all.